Oh, hey there, fellow naval gamers. Ruckdog back with another video. So, this video is something that I wanted to make based on some trends I've been seeing, maybe some alarming trends, in the wargaming market. It's not intended to be super controversial, but I'm sure some of you out there will have a difference of opinion. But I just wanted to let you know beforehand, this one might be slightly spicier than usual, especially if you find yourself to be a big booster of some of the games I'm going to mention in the upcoming video, so uh, fair warning. Anyway, let's get on with it. Yeah, so where have all the Class A games gone? This is a situation I've been observing over the course of this year that, to me, it feels like the availability and the number of naval war games on the market has been on a downward trend. And this is a little bit of a pattern, I think, that naval war gaming ebbs and flows over time, I have a podcast, a Ruck Dogs report that I did, oh, probably about three or four years ago now, where I talked about what I would consider one of the recent peaks in naval gaming, which was the year 2012. I might have to do an entire video update on that topic. But anyway, this video is about where have all the Class A games gone? And before we get much further, I suppose we should go ahead and do a little refresher on what a Class A game is. Now, this is something that I've, a concept I've used on the podcast basically since it started all the way back in 2015, 2016 time frame. And it's a, it's a concept that I made a video about uh, not too long ago here on the channel. Uh, so you'll be able to find that. I'll, I'll try and get a link put either in the description or somewhere in the video here on the screen. And if you haven't watched that video yet, I do recommend you go back and, and listen to it or watch it for a little bit more of an in-depth description about what it is a Class A, B, or C game is. But just as a top-level reminder, a Class A game is a game that is in production, and it's widely available both online and at brick-and-mortar retail stores. The way I like to describe this is that a Class A game is the kind of game where you have a better-than-even chance of walking into a random local game store and seeing it sitting on the shelf. Okay, that's that's really what a Class A game is. And you might have noticed from that description that this is nothing to say about the quality of a particular game, right? This, you know, this could be an absolutely terrible game, but if it's available in, you know, 90% of the game stores out there, then I would say that that's a Class A game, right? So, you know, in this case, Class A is not about quality. It's all about retail availability, all right? So, that leads me to the question at the heart of this video. Where have all the Class A games gone, okay? Because Star Wars Armada, I would say, was probably the leading Class A naval game that was available on the market. But with the recent news that that game is going out of production and out of distribution and having seen with my own eyes just how fast this game has disappeared from the store shelves in my area, I have to say that there's really not any Class A games out there at the moment. Um, this is sort of a bit of a drought for Class A gaming. And now, I'm sure some of you out there are going to say, what about insert game here, right? And this is a screen I'll throw up here where you have all these different games that are in production. You know, you've got Victory at Sea, you've got Star Trek Attack Wing, and it's it's Alliance sort of co-op slash single-player solo uh, spin-off is still in production. Dystopian Wars is still going. Great guns. I mean, we just have every month some amazing new models coming out for Dystopian Wars, and they just released Armored Clash for that game as well. War Cradle has finally moved back into the land game with their rescaled and rebranded version of the ground side of Dystopian Wars called Armored Clash. You've got Drop Fleet Commander, and we'll talk a little bit more about that one in particular, but that is definitely something that is still available and in production. And same thing with Mantix Armada, right, where you have a fantasy naval game. Again, still in active production and, and new product coming out for it on a routine basis. 
So why am I not considering any of these Class A games? Well, remember, this goes back to my definition of what a Class A game is, which is a game that you have a greater than 50-50 chance of seeing on a store shelf of any random local game store that you walk into. And based off of my observations at game stores spread across, oh, I don't know, let me think here, four or five states and both coasts over the course of the last year or so in my various travels, None of these games are really consistently there. I can think of one game store where I saw Victory at Sea on the shelf, and I can think of another game store where I happened to see some Star Trek Attack Wing product on the shelf. But I have not seen Dystopian Wars or Drop Fleet Commander or Mandic Armada ever on a store shelf anywhere here in the United States. Now, granted, there is probably some stores out there that do have this on the shelf. You know, I, I have obviously not set foot in every last gaming store in the country across this great land. And also, this is to say nothing about you know any game stores outside of the U.S. I mean, I'm sure somewhere in Europe, in England especially, or Great Britain especially, you can probably find some of these games on the shelves. But that being said, I, I don't think that that is a very common occurrence. My sense of the situation is that by and large, these are somewhat niche products that might have a small regional following here and there, but aren't really seeing mass market penetration and appeal in the same way that you know the older Spartan game versions of Dystopian Wars and Firestorm Armada did or Battlefleet Gothic did back in the day. And I think that's just sort of a, a fact of life. Which then leads us to a... <laughs> conclusion here that maybe isn't the happiest of conclusions if you're a naval combat wargaming fan, which is that it's pretty unlikely these days to find a naval game for sale on your friendly local gaming store shelf. And if you are like me, and one of those naval gaming fans, then that is clearly a bad thing. But there are some silver linings here. So, I think this is probably a temporary state of affairs. As I mentioned earlier in the video, naval wargaming kind of ebbs and flows. It's a bit of a sine wave. There's very, very strong years, little periods of time where naval war games are simply everywhere. And then there's periods of times where it goes back the other way. And naval wargaming is very hard to spot. There's not a lot of games on the shelves. And in those sort of dry times, you'll see a lot of naval gamers kind of retreat to their own clubs, their friend groups. Their uh, you know they'll play at events, at conventions, but they don't really necessarily dominate the scene at the local game store to an extent. Now, the other part of this, and the, another reason why I think this uh, that we might actually be sort of at the nadir or or sort of have bottomed out in terms of naval war gamings. Uh, penetration in the market at the moment is uh, there are some very very promising games on the horizon and I'm calling these my my contenders and I've got three of them and uh, we're going to talk about them each in turn okay so first up contender number one is drop zone commander uh, or excuse me drop fleet commander <laughs> I even wrote the slide wrong oh, I'm a dummy anyway drop fleet commander 2.0 okay now drop fleet commander uh, for those of you that haven't heard of it or run across it before, is a naval combat extension of the Drop Zone Commander. Uh, I think it's either 10 or 15 millimeter ground combat game. And the origins of this was under the old Hawk Wargaming logo that, and really sort of got start in like the 2012, 2013, 2014 time frame. In some ways, and so one of the rumors I've always heard is that some of the folks that started Hawk War Games were actually disaffected employees of Spartan Games. I've never seen that in writing, and I've never been able to uh, see anything that was definitive proof of that, so take it with a grain of salt. But regardless of whether that's true or not, it does seem pretty obvious to me that uh, Drop Zone Commander and then later Drop Fleet Commander were kind of responses to the Spartan uh, method of building games, you know, the Spartan engine and, and game style. So these play very differently. They have a very different focus, use different mechanics. The models and the style are very different. And I, I, I welcome that diversity. I'm not, this is not me saying, oh, hey, they, they tried to compete with Spartans, so I don't like them. No, this is saying, hey, these are definitely a, a, you know, worthy competitors. Now, there was a massive Kickstarter that launched the original uh, Drop Fleet Commander. 
And that Kickstarter did great guns. Um, there was a lot of excitement about it, um, including on my part. I backed that Kickstarter to a large amount. And part of the reason why was that Andy Chambers, um, one of the key movers and shakers and lead designers for Battlefleet Gothic, was also attached to the development effort for Drop Fleet Commander. And I think and his name recognition <laughs> it had a lot to do with how popular it was. Now, the fulfillment for that Kickstarter, as often Kickstarters have a tendency to do, didn't go as smoothly as originally planned. And at the end of it, Hawk War Games basically was in a position, and it's not clear to me whether it was just the people at, at Hawk War Games were sort of tired of dealing with it or if they were in a financial pinch, but they ended up transferring the Drop Fleet Commander and Drop Zone Commander rights to Tabletop Combat, a different company. And now Tabletop Combat has had the lead on the Drop Zone, Drop Fleet universe since I think circa 2017, basically right as the Kickstarter for the original Kickstarter for Drop Fleet kind of wrapped up. And this is a game that's sort of been cooking along in the back, background, excuse me, ever since. It has a convention presence. You see tournaments for it. It's at Gen Con with a large booth, and they're selling the product there. And, and so this is a game that's never really went away. But other than a very brief window immediately following the original Kickstarter, say in the 2017-2018 time frame, this is a game that just has not been on the shelves in stores. It's not really ever gotten that mass market appeal where you would see it just about everywhere. There was a, a, a brief period where it was available on store shelves, and then whatever didn't sell got moved to the discount rack, and then it was out of stores entirely. And that's certainly been the way that I've, I've, I've seen the trajectory of this game go. Now, all of that is changing because just last month, there was an announcement from Tabletop Combat that they are releasing a 2.0 version of Drop Fleet Commander, a brand new edition. And this is exciting because a new edition for a war game is always going to generate some excitement. But what I thought was interesting about this is the short window between when they announced that, hey, there's a new edition coming out, and when it's actually releasing. It's only about a month and a half, two months between the announcement and the actual release. As of right now, uh, the launch date here is barely, barely a week away uh, as I'm recording this, uh, 18 October. So it's available for pre-order as we speak, and it should be hitting uh, you know, mailboxes and store shelves hopefully here in the very new, near future. Uh, so that's sort of surprising. Usually you have a little more heads up or forewarning <laughs> of a, a new edition of a game dropping, but this seemed to sort of come a bit out of the blue, near as I can tell, based on the reactions to the announcement I'm seeing on social media. And it is something that seems to be met with a little bit of excitement other than <laughs> there was a little bit of initial consternation based on the way it was announced. Basically, they said, hey, this game is going to go out of production without really making it clear that's going out of production because they're releasing a new <laughs> edition of it. So it's one of those things where the communication could have been handled a little better. But in the end, the news overall is, is, is pretty good news. All right. So. Why am I saying that this is a contender for the, uh, you know, bringing back of Class A games into the market? Well, the models are really cool, right? The designs for the original models were always great, but this 2.0 edition is updating the existing designs, adding new classes, and adding a whole new race, uh, the Biofissers, I believe they're called. Those are the red models uh, that you see in all the promotional material. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you, you can see those in the little promotional picture I've got on the screen here. And that is a big selling point for a war game. How good do the models look? So the fact that they are really cool looking models is always a plus. The angle I'm talking about when I say that Drop Zone or Drop Fleet Commander has an interesting angle is that Drop Fleet Commander is all about planetary uh, you know, assaulting a planet, doing orbital insertions of ground troops, etc. Uh, so it, it sort of has a very different uh, play or feel to it than a lot of other games do. And it looks like, based on what I can tell, this is being preserved in the new edition. Uh, and this is something that we talked about way back when in, in the podcast when we did our review of, of Drop Fleet Commander is just how much of a, a different feel and a different perspective it has when you're talking about being a focus on those planetary assault type missions. 
The other thing that I think this game has got going for it is it does have an established community that's stuck with the game all of these past, you know, seven, eight years as it's been through the, the various trials and tribulations. Uh, and this game is still played in, in various corners. Obviously, it's not widely played as uh, you might uh, hope, but it is still played. And I think that if that community mobilizes and starts to run demos and evangelize the game a little bit, that it could actually get a lot of traction here with the new edition. So, all of that being said, uh, what are some possible problems? So, as I just said, this game isn't as widely played as we would like. So, there's there's not tons of market penetration right now. The setting, the IP, the, the drop fleet, drop zone setting isn't uh, widely known or immediately recognizable. It's not... Um, you know, Star Trek or Star Wars, as we'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, too. So that, that is a little bit of a downside. Um, and so it might kind of struggle uh, to, to get over the hump a little bit. But I'm hopeful, and I think that this game has an opportunity, or at least the possibility, of becoming a big hit. Certainly, I, I hope it does, and I, I wish it all success, because this is a game that, while I have not had a chance to play a whole lot in recent years, uh, I always did um, enjoy the setting for and the models for and then the gameplay of, so I really hope that it does make a, a big comeback here. All right, so on to contender number two, Leviathans. <laughs> All right, so who doesn't like their steampunk airship action, right? So Leviathans is an interesting case. This is uh, one of those games that made 2012 such a fun period for naval wargaming. It was a Kickstarter way back in the day. It released as a box set, and then it sort of ran afoul of some... Uh, issues with production and it kind of fizzled out and a more recent kickstarter here oh, about two years ago now had a big successful funding and is a uh, basically set and primed to bring this game back in a big way now the one challenge we've got here is we don't have a solid release date yet on when the various components of the kickstarter and the game are going to ship that's not to say that it's necessarily vaporware. The pre-production and now production models and boxes and maps and cards and tokens and all the other bits and pieces for the game have been shown off very publicly at places like Gen Con and Essen. So the game is definitely not vaporware. It just appears to be going through the usual challenges of trying to get over the production and shipping hump that a lot of larger, complex, miniature-heavy Kickstarters seem to have. So we don't really know what the re release date for this is going to be. Uh, from the latest updates to the Kickstarter, it seems like we are moving towards getting this game out either sometime towards the end of this year or maybe sometime in the first quarter of next year. So it is coming. I I'm actually really excited. I, I backed this Kickstarter uh, to a, a pretty hefty amount, so I've got lots of new ships coming for this game. Of course, I still have my original 2012-era box set sitting over here on my game shelf, so <laughs> I, I'm, I've never really quite given up on this game. Uh, so why do I think it's a contender? Well, it's a great theme, and it's a great setting, and this was always a strength of the game, uh, going back to the original edition. Catalyst Games Lab, the company behind this game, is also the company that has the Battletech license, and they applied the same level of care and attention to the world building for this game that Battle, uh, Battletech has benefited from over these decades. And what that means is the sort of the history and the points and where the history of Leviathans deviates from our own history have been very well thought out. The technology being used behind these flying ironclads has also been uh, pretty well thought out and described in the, the background material. So it's a very fleshed out setting already, even given the limited amount of product that's been released for it over the years. And another big thing that I like to take into account here is that this is, as I said, coming from Catalyst Game Labs. Catalyst Game Labs, while they don't have a perfect or sterling record when it comes to getting Kickstarters into the market, they do have a pretty good amount of market penetration with Battletech. Battletech has, I think, had a very big surge in popularity over the last couple of years, and that has definitely put Catalyst Games Lab in the public eye in a way that it hasn't been for much of the last decade. And so, because of all of that, I think that Leviathans has a good chance of becoming a very successful Class A naval game. 
but there are some challenges. So the the Kickstarter delays, and there's been some lack of clarity. Unfortunately, one of the folks that are in charge of community uh, communications for Leviathans was affected by the recent storms here in the United States. So uh, they're safe, but they've had to deal with some other issues, you know, property loss and the like. So you know, best wishes to them, and and I'm glad that they're they're safe at least from those events but it has kind of thrown a wrench in the way that this game is being marketed described and the way the community is being being kept in the loop right so that's a challenge and just like with the original drop zone commander i also worry about what i like to call the kickstarter to retail valley of death which is a game has a huge massively successful kickstarter and then for any number of reasons doesn't actually manage to be a successful retail product and then there's there's probably a whole other videos worth of discussion that we could do about that as a matter of fact note to self make a video about the kickstarter to retail valley of death so yeah um overall i am still very excited for leviathans the models look great the setting is a lot of fun the gameplay, uh, from what I can tell from the pre-release of the rules manual that the backers were given access to, looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. So so this is high on my radar as a, a, a potential contender to bring Class A gaming back into the naval sphere here. All right, so number three. Contender number three is Star Trek Into the Unknown. And, and you probably knew this was coming if you've seen me or listened to me talk about uh, naval gaming to any amount of time recently. I'm a big Star Trek fan, so automatically something that's got the Star Trek IP attached to it is going to have my attention. <laughs> but this game especially looks really good. So this is being put out by WizKids, who have done the Star Trek Attack Wing game for, oh, I don't know, what, the last uh, 12, 13 years? It's been a, been a while. Star Trek Attack Wing has been going for quite a while. Um, it's fair to say, though, that Star Trek Attack Wing is kind of on its last legs. The game isn't entirely out of production, but it's not really a big focus area for WizKids. They're sort of putting out the odd box set here and there. Like I said, they've, they've gone with a solo-slash-co-op version of the game lately. But ultimately, the, this is just a, a game that's, I think, probably about at the end of its life cycle, all things considered. And now, this is looking to be the replacement. So, what this essentially is, it's a miniatures game that's using relatively large miniatures. It's, it's hard to tell from this one pre-production photo I've got here, but that Enterprise D is going to be roughly, uh, I think, uh, somewhere between 10 and 12 inches long. So, a good-sized model, somewhere in the order of about 1 2500 scale, which is a really good scale for Star Trek. Um, and... It is going to be a more uh, tactical game. It's going to, you know, I, I think that, I, I've often said that Star Trek Attack Wing is a fun game, but part of the, part of the problem with it is that it is using the um, Star Wars X-Wing uh, movement set, the rules for it, basically. It's using the engine for, there we go, that's the right word, the engine <laughs> for Star Wars X-Wing. And so what that means is, you have ships doing loop the loops, implements, all these crazy acrobatic maneuvers that you would normally associate with a X-wing or a fighter, you know, a fighter jet or a fighter craft of some kind. Not something you would expect to see, like the Enterprise D or a Romulan Warbird pulling off. And so this game is going to be a bit more, um, a bit more subdued, it seems like, in terms of its movement. Uh, so that's good. Um, we. It's available for pre-order, which is great, but we don't have a firm release date. So all, all we can tell is it's going to be coming supposedly sometime before the end of the year. So so why is it a contender? Well, like I said, Star Trek IP, that's a big one. Uh, the models are pretty nice. As you can see here from this picture that I'm showing, if you're watching on YouTube, it's a nice pre-painted model, good detail, uh, both in terms of the painting and on the sculpt for the model itself. Uh, Star Wars Armada designers, some, some of the folks responsible for the development of Star Wars Armada are also attached. Uh, so I think this is going to be uh, something of a spiritual successor of Star Wars Armada. Not necessarily a, a reskin or clone of Star Wars Armada, certainly, but a, a sort of spiritual successor, which I think is exciting considering how awesome of a game Star Wars Armada is. And uh, this is something that, uh, be, you know, because of all of that, um, has the potential to be a, a very popular game. And I'm certainly looking forward to it. Now, potential problems. So 
Yes, large prepaying models are awesome, but the downside to large prepaying models is they are expensive. It's it's that's one of the things that sort of ended up killing Star Wars Armada in the end is that it was a struggle for Fantasy Flight games and then later Atomic Mass games to design, produce, and sell these large prepainted, highly detailed miniatures at a profit. So what that means is is that we're probably going to see some fairly hefty price tags associated with the Star Trek Into the Unknown line. Uh, the starter set, which is supposed to have the Enterprise D, I believe the Defiant, and then a Jim Hadar ship in it, is supposed to be running $150, which is a, a little steep for somebody who might have lots of Star Trek attack wing models and just wants to try the new game. So, so it'll definitely be a little bit of a challenge. It'll be interesting to see how WizKids manages that going forward. Um, there's been a lack of clarity so far on the release date. We, like I just mentioned, we don't have a firm release date yet, although they are taking pre-orders. And we also don't really have a roadmap for what's coming for the rest of the year and into next year as far as, hey, we get, you know, what's, what's the first expansion set? When are we going to see the Klingons or the Romulans, et cetera, et cetera. So far, all we've seen are a few Federation ships and uh, a couple Jim Hadar ships. So you add all that together and... One might, you know, a gamer might be forgiven for being a little leery about buying into this right away. So that could hurt its initial introduction if we don't get a lot more information and a lot more details on what is going on with Star Trek and the Unknown. Like I said, I'm personally very excited about this, and I've already got my pre-order in at my local game store, and I'll be jumping in onto this one as soon as I can. But that's because I'm a crazy Star Trek fan, right? So you know, if you're not a big Star Trek fan, this I could easily see how this could be a little bit of a tougher sell for you. Anyway, uh, so those are my three contenders. Um, you know, just to do a quick review, we got the Drop Fleet Commander 2.0, we've got Leviathans, and we've got Star Trek Into the Unknown. Those are the three games I'm watching here as we move towards the end of 2024. Uh, but they're the three games I think have the best chance of reestablishing some Class A presence in a local game store. So. We'll watch those uh, as we move through the rest of the year, into next year, and I also do intend to do a little bit of a review for each one uh, as much as I can here. So uh, please uh, you know, stay tuned for that. All right, well, thanks for watching. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen to me ramble on here about Class A Gamings, where they've gone, and where we might be able to see a resurgence in those types of games at uh, game stores. If you have any games that uh, I didn't mention that you think would be a contender, I'd love to hear about them. I'm always anxious to hear more about uh, new naval games. Likewise, if you disagree with any of my characterizations of some of the currently existing games out there, games that I would sort of consider to be like a Class B or B game that you think would more properly be considered a Class A game, I'd love to hear your discussion on that in the comments below as well. And if you enjoyed this video, of course, uh, I'd appreciate a like and also a subscribe if you'd like to hear more such naval wargaming ramblings in the future. <laughs> Until next time, this is Ruckdog saying good luck and good hunting.